Well, welcome to uh, my seminar on the road tax engines today. Thank you very much for taking the time to, uh, to stop in. Hopefully, uh, you can learn something while you're here today, because that's why I like to do these. Uh, it's uh, get the information out there. It makes it a lot safer. If you're having a problem, maybe you can solve it. You're far away from somewhere. Uh, so, got to do the disclaimer first. So I'm not employed by Rotax. I'm employed by myself. Um, I have uh, I operate an independent Rotax service center in Whitby, Ontario, which is just a little bit east of the big Toronto. And uh, the presentation is my own opinions. Uh, some of them may or may not be endorsed by Rotax. The yeah, legal part done. So today, what I wanted to talk about actually is I get some phone calls and some topics and some questions. These are ones that I got like over the last year. So um, interactive. So if I'm explaining something and I'm not doing a very good job of it, then please ask and say, okay, can you clear this up? And then uh, everybody will benefit from that. Uh, I'm going to talk, there's the topics there. We're going to do compression testing, uh, EGT, which is typically always an issue, uh, carburetor balance, what should you do to store your engine? Maybe you put it away in the fall and you don't fly again until the spring. What should you be doing with it? Um, carburetor heating. And, uh, and actually, uh, a new one that I haven't done before in a seminar is the charging system. There's, there's, uh, I got quite a few calls on that this year. So, now, compression testing. So, first off, when, uh, when, I, when I was putting this seminar together, wasn't really sure the demographics here this year because it's a, it's a little different than it has been in the past. It's been typically all two-stroke. So I did incorporate some 912, some four-stroke uh, information into this one. Um, so, is there anybody here with a four-stroke, a 912? There you go. Perfect. A couple of them, that's great. And, uh, but primarily a lot of two-stroke. Uh, now, on the, on the four-stroke engines, on the 912s, you're going to do a cylinder leakage test. So, this doesn't really apply. Uh, on the two-strokes, you want to do a compression test. Same idea as you would do a compression test on a car. So, it's the same kind of gauge. So it would be good, you need to do this annually, and the reason that it's important to do it is you want to track the performance of the engine, the compression that we're talking about right now. So you've got your, uh, you got your brand new airplane, everything is working perfect. Try and, try and get a, a reasonably good quality gauge, you don't have to spend a million dollars on it, but something pretty reasonable, um, and uh, take care of it, don't throw it in the bottom of your toolbox. So here where it says, is a gauge calibrated? And this is where I'm talking about. If you buy a gauge, reasonable quality, even if it's out a few pounds, for the purpose of what you're going to do, it really isn't going to matter. My gauge that I take when I travel to repair airplanes, it has to be calibrated and it has to be perfect. The one that you can buy for your own use, it can be out a few pounds and it won't matter. Because um, you're going to use the same tool next time. You're going to take care of it. So it's relative then, right? If you have a percentage change, we're not going to worry so much about the particular number, whether it's 110 or it's 113. We're looking at what is it this year with that gauge, what is it next year with that gauge. Does this make sense? Okay. So that's what I'm after on this one. So and the, and the very important thing is make sure you record it in your engine logbook and you should have that. Um, quite often I get engines that come into the shop and uh, they have no logbook, nothing at all. So from my perspective, especially uh, on some of them, I can't, I can't see if some of the uh, directives have been done with them already. So it takes more time to assess what you've got. And if anybody ever wants to see your logbook, you're not going to have one. That's not good. It's going to affect the price of your airplane if you ever went to sell it. So make sure that you have a logbook, you use it, and you uh, record these in here. So the point of doing this is we want to do this the same way every time. So I would suggest that you warm up the engine. It doesn't have to be red hot, burning hot, full, full temperature so that you burn your fingers when you're working on it. Warm it up to a certain temperature, write it down. 
Okay, obviously you're gonna secure it from starting, you know, keys in your pocket, whatever you need to do so that you can be around the engine and it won't start. And uh, one spark plug from each cylinder. And of course this is a 582, so here's the one out there and here's the gauge going into that one. Now, the ACS key switch, that's basically the aircraft um, spruce one, which is what most of the airplanes have in it. It's the one where you turn it uh, left, right, both ignitions, and then crank to start it and run. So on that one, if you're going to turn the engine over using the key, just like you're starting the airplane, the ignition system is live. Where are the spark plug wires? A couple of the spark plug wires at this point, they're just hanging in the open with nowhere to go. So that can be hard on the ignition system on the ignition modules. So we want to ground them out because now they're not sparking through the spark plug, they're just hanging there. So there's a couple of ways we can do that and I'll show you in the next slide. If you have the toggle switches for your mag PTO and a, just a push button to crank it, that's fine. You'll leave those off and crank the engine that way. Does that make sense to everybody? So gonna put the gauge in. Now here's a do-it-yourselfer tool because we need to ground the spark plug. The, uh, the spark plug leads that are hanging there, we need to ground them. So this is nothing more than, well, I used two brand new spark plugs so the picture looked prettier. But uh, a couple of old spark plugs, a hose clamp around it, a ground wire. So attach your two loose spark plug wires onto that. Put the clip onto the ground somewhere on the, on the motor, bolt, whatever. And you can crank it over with your key switch and not worry about having to damage the ignition. Okay? Now, the one, this one here, this is the one that I have in my toolbox. And uh, that's why it's kind of bent because it's not, it's just old spark plugs, has a ground wire on the end. And I can put all four on there at the same time because they're spaced far enough apart. So you can, uh, these things here, you can come up with a good solution. You know, that's a piece of aluminum, four old spark plugs, piece of wire, and away you go. But do make sure that if you do crank the engine over and the spark plug wires are not attached to the spark plugs, that you ground them somehow. So the reason we do that is because that ignition system will make a lot of power. So it's basically like a lightning bolt with nowhere to go. And you don't want that to happen because if it back feeds into the ignition, then it'll take out the module. And that equals, you're trying to do some maintenance here to keep your airplane going good, and you just ruined something. Not a good plan. Okay, so back in compression testing here. So of course, you're gonna make sure the, the, uh, the prop is, uh, is clear. Uh, and, uh, and see, we're gonna lock the throttle wide open. It's important to get the right numbers when you're cranking the engine over a compression test that the carburetor is wide open so that when the engine goes to breathe in some air, it can get it. So you should end up with the proper, proper numbers. Okay, you're gonna crank it at normal RPM. Uh, there's not too many airplanes with a, with a rope anymore, but if you have a recoil start, pull it the same way that you do when you start it. So the engine spins the same speed. Now you got two choices on it. So uh, we can, we can uh, right here, we can crank it until the gauge stops going up, that's fine. Or we can crank at a certain number of pumps. Write it down in your book. And it should kind of look like, it's a little messy, but that was the little one I did just for this example, okay? So it shows the date, shows the hours on the engine. I did a compression test. There's the result from the mag and the PTO, uh, the numbers. And I, I chose it to do eight pumps. So as the engine was cranking over, the needle went one, two, three, four, five, up to eight. And I stopped and I read it. Okay, and I had the throttle open. So I write this in my book because I'm not gonna do this for another year. So now next year, you're gonna use the same gauge, even if it's out a couple of pounds from perfect, it doesn't matter because that's what gave you those numbers Hopefully next year you get numbers that are pretty much the same, okay? Uh, example for 582, 110 to 125 PSI and within 10% difference, okay? So that's what the 10% is for. All right, and then uh, remove all your equipment, put the airplane back together and finish your maintenance and go for a fly. 
Uh, it, they're usually a little bit less than that. The idea is that you want to track a trend. So right now, like I say, the airplane is running perfect. It's, it's making good power. It's doing everything. So I'm taking my gauge, and I want to find out where is it at today. Okay, where is it going to be? At? Is it the same place next year? Is it the same place the year after? Okay, it's just going to help you keep track of things. So here's a big one that's always popular, and it's not only temperatures with the two-stroke engines, but also with the four-stroke engines. But the, these ones here I want to cover uh, is for the two-stroke engines. So typically when somebody calls and I'm talking to them about this issue, then they always give me the cruising, what the temperature is while they're cruising. And I always ask, what's the temperature when you're climbing out? And typically, nobody knows. So I have to say, okay, well, the next time you're flying the airplane, I mean, it's running fine. It's still safe to fly and everything. Let's see what it is when you're climbing out. So you notice the, the, the difference is uh, on uh, the temperatures is, of course, here's, here's departure. So we're climbing out. So we'll, we'll use, the, uh, we'll use the, uh, the low number of 900. And then when we switch and level off, we're going to go and we're going to go to 1050 when we throttle back and we're on cruise. So why is it so much less when we're departing? Okay. That's a, that's a pretty good answer. Thank you. Okay. So a lot of gas going in the carburetor, uh, cooling down the engine. So basically it has to do with the systems in the carburetor. So when the engine, the throttle is wide open, we have, you know, we all know that we have the, the needle in the needle jet and we can adjust the clip. But when the throttle is wide open, the slide is all the way up. The needle is pretty much, for, for our talk right now, not blocking and it's restricting the hole at all. So where's the restriction? The restriction, restriction is, the only one is the main jet. So if we have this, say, 900 degrees when we climb out, so that tells me that the fuel lines are not sucking in air. It's flowing fuel. Make sense? Right from the gas cap. The vent, the vent. I mean, this would take a effect after you flew it for a while, but we're checking right from the gas tank. So there's no leakage in the lines. The lines are not plugged or pinched. The fuel filter is not restricted or dirty. Uh, the fuel pump. Uh, on the engine is working fine because it's supplying adequate fuel to the main jet. Does that make sense? So see, when you, when you, get, when you get that information, it, it'll check a lot of things that you probably don't even think about. Okay? So if it climbs out at 1,000 degrees and they call back and say, oh, yes, it climbs out at 1,000 degrees, perfect. Okay. Now you level off, you pull the power back, the cruise power, uh, 75%. And they're not usually sure what 75% is. So on a Rotax two-stroke, do we know what 75% power is? Okay, I have 52 or 53, okay? And I have a 57 here, okay? Yes, and another 57. So that's, that's excellent. So we need to do, we're going to talk about that a little bit right now. So... Cruise power, or 75% power, or three quarters, if you want, it's not where the throttle is positioned. It's based on propeller RPM, and this is the way I do it. So we can only... It's okay, you're buying coffee out here. <laughs> Okay, it has to do with the speed of the propeller. The propeller it can only go so fast. And on a Challenger, uh, in our example on a Challenger, it's 2.6 to 1 from the big to the small with the drive belt. So we want to track the RPM of the propeller, uh, the maximum RPM, and then there's a graph chart uh, that you can use and take into consideration the reduction ratio, and it works back, and it gives you a crankshaft speed. And that's how you do it. So what's your maximum crankshaft speed? And then using the chart, you can go down and find the three quarters. So for, uh, 
503. Uh, it's going to climb out on a Challenger. It's going to climb out at, uh, John's climbs out at probably 6150. Okay, 6300. Okay. <laughs> All right, so it's just tuned up and it revs higher. <laughs> so it determines the maximum on that. And when we're looking at it, his, his is going to be about, is it going to be 5,700 RPM is 75% power. And that's pretty much across the board. Okay. Uh, you can go through the whole formula and figure it out, but that's what it is. Um, now, the, the problem with, with uh, it, it's not a problem, but the engine was designed to run all day long at 75% power. Okay. Uh, when we went to uh, Alberta, I was 6,100 all the way out there and I was 6,100 all the way back because I got a different prop on it for the floats and, and my maximum RPM is higher. Okay, so it's all relative to the maximum RPM. Um, and I'll tell you, run it all like that when you stop for gas and the engine's idling, oh man, you can tell it sounds so good. It's just happy, you know. It's, it's been doing everything it wants to do at the right RPM and it's, and it's the way it should be. Uh, if you're running at a lower RPM, uh, you know, you get, it gets its best fuel economy. It makes the most continuous power at 75%. That's the design. If you're running at a lower RPM, you're going to get worse fuel economy. You'll actually get a little more engine wear because it's actually, it's actually, you know, lugging. It's not in its happy spot. Um, and typically you'll hear it, but if you, if you, if you think to really listen to it, you'll hear it when you get to that 5,700, 5,650, 5,750, whatever it is, depending upon the drag on the airframe, you'll hear the engine and it's going to have that little, little different in it and it's going to be its happy spot. Okay. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the EGTs. So uh, now the, the big question is, now that we've, we've got that sorted out, then uh, yeah, what we're assuming here on this discussion is the engine's all set to factory specs. So it doesn't have somebody took a drill and drilled out the main jet or something or changed all this stuff. These engines are designed to run on the aircraft in the stock as it came from the factory. Okay, and of course, obviously, for this discussion, the engine's running normally. It's it's fine, and uh, you're using the recommended prop. Okay, so you're not trying to turn a five-bladed prop on a 503 or something that you saw on the internet or something, right? So you're using all common things here, right? The engine's all stock. It runs okay. It has the recommended or common propeller on. Now, here we go. How come our Exhaust gas temperature is at 1,200 or higher when we're cruising. Does anybody have anything for that? Okay, run, running lean. Sorry, I heard prop, prop pitch is too low or running lean. Okay, so which, who, okay, we got two schools of thought here. Who's for propeller is not adjusted properly? Okay, two. And for too lean, so the jet or something. Right. Okay. Okay, so there we go. So way more for jetting. So in reality, the biggest is the propeller. Okay. There can be some special cases, but this is all designed to run, to have the temperatures regulated by the propeller, believe it or not. Okay. So. The pitch angle. So less blade angle or less pitch in the propeller gives us a couple of things. It gives us, well, high exhaust temperature and it gives us a lot of RPM. Okay, so really high RPM and high exhaust temperature. So of course the opposite is true when we put more blade on it. So we, we, we adjusted it and we put way too much on it. Now we're going to have extremely low exhaust temperatures, way less RPM, wide open throttle, and because the exhaust temperature and the cylinder head temperature is like a teeter-totter, they both can't be low and they both can't be high. So in this one here, with a lot of pitch angle, we're going to have a low exhaust temperature, but we're going to have a high cylinder head temperature because the engine is lugging really working hard and you're not getting any. These things make sense? Okay. 
So it's one of the, it's, it really is common. So there you go, that's it, sums it up. So exhaust temperature, it's all about prop loading. Okay, all about prop loading. So I have a little example here, and what we're gonna do is, we're gonna take this 582 engine that just came out of a box, we're not gonna touch it, we're gonna put it on a side-by-side -side seating aircraft, okay? And as it says, side-by-side -side seating aircraft, it's got a wide cabin, so it has, obviously it has more aerodynamic drag, just because of the shape of it. So this one, say the manufacturer or propeller recommends we start at 11 degrees, so we start at 11 degrees. Now when we uh, do our run up on the ground, we'll see a big number, 6,500 RPM. Okay, no problem. So now when we go and fly it, wow, it's at 1125, it's right where we want it. Okay, so that combination of putting that engine out of the box with the manufacturer's recommendation on the prop, that worked like perfect, right? It doesn't always work that way. So now we'll take the engine off of that side-by-side -side plane. So we're taking the same engine. I use Challenger 2 uh, uh, as an example because, I mean, the aerodynamics on that airplane is just like a bullet, and it's uh, inline seating. So very, very low aerodynamic drag. We'll all agree on that. So we take this engine, we put it on, and right off the hop, the prop manufacturer says that we should probably start at 12 and a half degrees. It's a lot more, a degree and a half difference for the same engine, but now we have less drag from the airframe. So we get what we expect to see on the engine, 5,800. That's is all it'll do. Now, because the, uh, the plane is so aerodynamic, when you take off, you'll usually see 61, 62 sometimes, and, you know, 63, okay, if you just had a tune-up. <laughs> so... So um, anyway, and then of course, and the exhaust temperature is where it should be. So the whole thought on this is, take into consideration when, you, uh, when you're doing this, drag from the airframe makes a big difference. So if you have a Challenger 2, and we'll use that for an example, it has uh, wheel pants on it, it's gonna be pretty slippery compared to one that has the big tires on it for landing on rocks somewhere. So it all, it's the same aircraft, it's the same airframe. You know, what, what is there differences like that in the size of the tires? The, you know, there's so many things that can be involved in what you do. Does it have fairings on the gear legs? Does it not have fairings on the gear legs? So there's no real hard and fast rule of this is how many degrees that you put on this particular plane. That's a good place to start, but you'll have to tune it. Okay. Does this all make sense to do it this way? Okay. That, that's what I was after, because if you kind of understand the process of, of that, now you can reverse engineer it, you'll know what to do and get going the right way. So I'm going to talk about 912 prop loading. So this is what happens if the prop is, if it's, if it's too coarse, what does it do? Same idea as on the two-stroke. It increases the load on the engine a lot, okay? But it's a little different deal. <coughs> the RPM is a little different scale. So if we cruise with a 912 at less than 5,000 RPM, you can actually damage the engine. So you're not going to make it last longer by not revving it up as much. You can actually do harm to it eventually. Um, it can come from, uh, if, if there's any, uh, potentially the gas is not the greatest, you're using car gas, um, and it's not the greatest anymore, it's old, um, and you can run into some detonation issues. So detonation is hard to explain, but on an old-fashioned car, they used to ping, and you could hear that pinging noise. So think of it sort of similar to that. But on the airplane, you're never going to hear that engine complain. It could be pinging like crazy from poor gas. You'll never hear it. You just won't. So uh, there's no advance warning. It's not like, well, okay, I can hear this, so I better change something. You won't hear it. Uh, the other issues with a two course of a propeller, as well as the lower RPM on cruise, uh, is that, of course, it's not going to take off very well, because it's not in its power band. The engine's going too slow. 
actually. It's like trying to pull away from the lights in second gear if you have a standard, right? We want to be in first gear to pull away from the light. So we're trying to take off in second gear, not good. Uh, higher engine temperatures really has to do with the, uh, with the cylinder head temperature or the coolant on the newer ones. They measure the temperature different, differently. Uh, but high temperatures because the engine's lugging, it's working so hard. Trying to, trying to pull the airplane, and of course the fuel economy, not good. Because again, it's out of its power band. It's not in its most efficient place to run. So here's a good way to do it that, that I think works really good. So always start with the propellers, the propeller manufacturer specifications. And again, I qualify that with, it's not going to be some five-bladed thing that you bought from Amazon or something. It needs to be the right propeller for the airplane, the ones that everybody kind of uses. And also, may I note on, a, on the 912s, and it also applies to the two-strokes, all the Rotax engines, is that there's a, uh, a moment for the propellers. So there's a particular a propeller can be too heavy, and it has like a flywheel effect and doesn't want to and it's hard on the engine, it's hard on the gearbox. So there's actually, uh, I, should have, I should have made a little picture of it, but uh, the, the brief note on it is you take your propeller, there's two little teeny cables that hang down to a little cross strip. The propeller's bolted onto it and it's hanging by these two little strips. Then you, over here, you move the propeller about 10 degrees and let go. And you start your stopwatch. And the propeller oscillates back and forth. And there's a, a, a chart for how many times it oscillates over a certain period of time. And it gives you the moment of inertia of the propeller. So because if you have a really heavy propeller on a 912, then you probably knock the gearbox out of it. It's going to have all kinds of gearbox problems. OK, so now, so. The plane's good to fly. We went with the a normal propeller. We got the manufacturer specs on it. So we're going to go for a flight. We're going to get up to cruising altitude. If you like to fly at 2,000, 5,000, you pick it. Straight and level. Okay. Let's go wide open for a little less than a minute. And let's find out what the maximum RPM is. Okay. We'll write it down on our kneeboard so that we know. So if it results in and you get lucky and everything, depending upon you've got wheel pants or you don't have wheel pants and, uh, and that. If you ended up with, uh, with your uh, 50, uh, in, in, the, in the sweet spot there, 55 to 5600 5, wide open, that's cool because when you go back down to cruise RPM, then you're probably going to see 51 to 50, which is also good. Okay? If it ends up like that, that's going to give you the best of both worlds. We have a fixed, uh, a ground adjustable prop. It's not like, uh, so that's what we're talking about on this example. So now we've got an adjustment that's good for takeoff, and it's pretty good for cruise as well, right? It's sort of the best of both worlds that we can get with one propeller. Uh, really good fuel economy in, uh, in cruise, it'll really come up. And of course, as I was talking about, if the engine's lugging, it's going to have extra wear. Okay, so it's going to reduce the wear during heavy loads, like when you're taking off, because the engine's going to be revving up where it's supposed to be. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's talk about some carburetor balance. And again, that's a big 54 carburetor from any of the two-stroke motors, the 503 or the 582. So, of course... The engine's off and it's secured from accidentally starting, and you're going to go through all the adjustments, the basic adjustments to mechanically calibrate, I'm um, sorry, mechanically synchronize the carburetors. So there's about a million different ways to do it on the internet. Pick the one you like, and it's probably going to, it'll run. It'll run okay. It should, if you do it right, it should idle and it should do all those other things. But if you really want it to run really, really nice and smooth, then you need to use a water manometer. So what I did a long time ago is I went, and you know there's the one with the uh, yardstick with the tubing on it and you put the oil in it and all this other stuff. It doesn't work, okay? 
that's what you need. And uh, I think uh, Patrick made one of those. I think he, he likes it. Uh, and what it is is uh, just what it is. It's just a wooden board. Uh, mine's got a hinge in the middle so I can fold it in half to put it in my car when I travel with it. Uh, and 20 feet of vinyl tubing. And you can tape the tubing on. You can put it on with little clips, whatever. And you fill it with water. Um, so this is basically two meters. And at one meter is where you want to fill the water to. So from here down in both sides is water. And from there up is all air. Okay. Now it's kind of a big and big tool, but it like works. And uh, it's very, uh, very effective. So the two, uh, each line, each line goes on the carburetor right on that. It's the primer port, so you put it right on there. Okay, and then you can secure it from uh, getting caught uh, in the prop. I generally actually lay it down. So it'll lay down and work this way, but it won't work sideways, obviously, because the, water's, the water has to be on the top, not the sides. So on a float plane, on a float challenger, I put it by the wing strut and lay it down at the front on the ground and use it. Um, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't have to be straight up and down. No, but this, but when you look at this side of it, it has to face the sky if you're going to put it on an angle. Okay, it can't face the side, it has to face the sky. And it'll work on an angle. You understand what I mean? Oh, okay. Did you do it with yours standing straight up? Good for you. <laughs> I mean, that it's hard to do. Yeah. No, exactly. This, this, uh, yeah. To do it that way, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's safer to do it that way. So, so this is touching the ground. Around about here is laying on the strut, so that it's on an angle about like this. Okay, on the butt on the wing strut, and then hook it up. And as long as the the tubes that have the the water and the air in it is like I say facing the sky, it'll work because it doesn't it doesn't matter if it's this way or that way. Try it with yours, you'll see. So anyway, it's something that you can make. You make it over the winter, uh, get it ready for the springtime, whatever. It's cheap and it's easy to do, and uh, you can really fine tune and trim the carburetors. So that it runs really smooth. Typically, the biggest difference is, uh, like say on a Challenger, when you look out under the wing, you'll see the material is fluttering a bit at idle. You can pretty much get rid of that because you've fine-tuned it that nice. It really works well. So anyway, so that's something that do-it-yourself one that you can make for like 20 bucks. So this one here, uh, the, the 912 uh, balance one, it's it's like a couple of people walking along, right? They're trying to hold hands and they're trying to work walk perfectly in step. So the whole hands part's easy because the carburetors are bolted on the engine. So what we need to do is keep them both walking in step. Okay? But what happens is one of them's been working all day and it's kind of dragging along and the other one just had a nap and it wants to go faster and you have one side of the engine fighting the other side. So if you think about a 912, all of the 9 series engines, they have two cylinders over here, and they, and they have their ignition, but two cylinders on this side with a carburetor. Two cylinders on this side of the motor with a carburetor. So it's basically like two two-cylinder engines, each having their own carburetor, that need to run perfectly together because they're hooked together. Okay? So if you have one side of the engine trying to cruise at, uh, trying to cruise along at, uh, at uh, 5100, and the other side of the engine is trying to cruise along at 5250, they're having a battle. They're having a fight. It's not going to be very smooth. You can get some vibrations. Uh, it's one of the. It's the first thing you check for vibrations is make sure the carburetors are balanced on a 912. There can be other issues in the gearbox that can actually make it vibrate as well. But um, so, how do we actually get the things to work together? That's the hard part. So, they need to be clean and functional. Obviously, the carburetors need to not be a million years old. And uh, they, so they need to be looked at so that they're proper. You do all the basic carb adjustments, and again, you know, you can find that's in all the Rotax manuals, but it seems like most people get it from uh, Mr. Google. Uh, but do it whatever way you want so that they're both the same. Now, 
the items in bold are really important on a 912 because this is where a lot of the problems come from. So a throttle stop was adjusted correctly. So we don't have to, we won't have to worry about that uh, in reality on a two stroke, but we have to worry about that a lot on a four stroke engine. The way the carburetors are, are built, they're sprung on a four stroke so that if the cable breaks, they go wide open. So the cable has to pull it back to idle. Okay? So if they're not adjusted, if you don't have the throttle stop adjusted properly, then here's an example. So you're coming into land and you didn't really realize that, yeah, there is actually a little tailwind, so you're using a little more runway than normal, and you're really pushing it to idle. Right? It's just instinctive to do that. When you're doing that and the, and it doesn't have a physical stop. It's going to bend the linkage on the carburetor. So even though you just synchronized those carburetors, you uh, spent, you know, Saturday afternoon, and you went through all the little adjustments, hopefully using the Rotax manuals, and uh, got the um, mechanical adjustments done, and uh, you uh, you ended up with a with a vacuum gauge or a carb made to do it, and they're like perfect. You went sweet success. This thing runs. Smooth as a watch. Okay. It's going to run smooth as a watch until you ram it back to idle really hard. And then you're going to bend it. And now the adjustment's gone. Okay. So it's something I find a lot of, actually, in, in a lot of aircraft, is there's no throttle stop. So it should have a throttle stop for the idle, and it should have it for wide open. So that's important. And the other thing is the cables aren't binding. So what happens is, is that Sometimes because we have two cables and some of the cable setups on some of the airplanes is less than desirable. And it will have flex in the mechanism that goes from, there's a lever inside with one cable that goes to like a cross rod. And it has a couple of other rods on it that go together with cables. Everything moves a little bit. That's where you can get into issues there. So you have to make sure all of that is in good condition. And if the cables bind at all, you're never going to keep the carburetors in there, ever. It's just not going to happen. You can do it again and again and again and again. So if you know somebody who's been working with their 912, they can never keep the carburetor synced, then there's two things that you can say. Well, you can use it real cool now. Has it got an idle stop on the throttle? Does it have a wide open stop? Are the cables perfect? Well, you just throw those cables away, put new cables on it, and see what happens. Right? It's one of those kind of simple things you don't think about. Yeah, the cable's on there, it's hooked up, but it has to be perfectly free, no binding. Um, the thing I put on here about the test instrument being calibrated, you can use a pair of vacuum gauges um, to uh, and make a little setup for balancing your carburetors. But the chances of having two gauges read exactly the same as like winning the lottery. So you really need to hook both gauges together to something and make sure that, to one of the ports to make sure that they both read the same. And if they don't, make sure you can adjust them somehow. Because if you're trying to do it with gauges that are out, you'll never fix it. Okay, back to two-stroke. So, 582. If your 582 is trying to jump off the back of your Challenger when it's at idle and it's new, which is usually when you notice it, uh, there's a way to fix it. So this is the picture of, a, of an idle jet, and it regulates how much fuel the liquid part of it, excuse me, an air is metered through for idle. So it mixes. The jet is actually, the little orifice is right inside here, where of course you can't see. These little holes are where the air and fuel mix together because liquid gas doesn't burn. So what happens is they come with a number 45, uh, sorry, they come with a number 55 from the factory. And this is a number 45. So why is it going to make a difference? Why did they put the wrong one in it to begin with? Actually, they didn't. They put the one in it that it calls for in all the specifications. However, do we know uh, 582 has a rotary valve? I've got a cutaway out on the bench there if you want to look at it after. And as the crankshaft turns, the rotary valve also turns. 
So there has to be a coordination in there to the timing on the rotary valve so that everything is coordinated, just like a timing belt in a car, right? The timing belt turns the cam on the top and the crank turns in the bottom and they have to be coordinated action. So through factory tolerance, if the, if the rotary valve timing is advanced, then it's going to have poor idle quality with the standard jet because it's in an advanced position and the only way to fix it, in reality, easy, simple, clean way to do it, is change. Okay. Now the specification on the how can it be off that far, just to mention, so the specification for rotary valve timing in a 582 is zero degrees plus and minus four. Okay, so you got like an eight degree window for this to work on. So if it's over here at, at, at minus four or retarded four, it's okay. And if it's over here at plus four, it's okay. But is it gonna run different? Absolutely. And this is, this is how you fix it. So if it has retarded plate timing in it, the 55 jet works perfect. If it has advanced rotary plate timing in it, you need this. So when I get an engine in, I always look to see, I always want the carburetors with it anyway, so I can make sure they function properly and they're clean. And I want to see what jet's in it to begin with because I do my utmost best to set it to zero to a half a degree, uh, the rotary plate timing. So when it leaves the shop, it's going to be right on spec, as close as you can possibly make it. And there's a half a degree window in there. So if it came in with 55 jets in it, then when it goes out, it's going to need a pair of these. Or the, or the person's going to put it back on and say, well, my idle's rough. It's rough because the engine is as close to spec as I can make it, and it wasn't before, and it had that jet that made it work. Save fuel. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So engine storage, I, get, I still get a lot of questions about engine storage. So it's the same old deal, right? You want to fly in today. As a good example, in 2018, Claude will be amazed at this, I don't think I flew 10 hours. Yeah, okay. So it's always the kind of deal uh, is, yeah, I went for a flight today. It's Saturday. It's going to be nice tomorrow. I'm coming back for sure. Well, something happens in life when you don't get back, and then next Saturday is raining, and the kid's got a birthday, grandkids, and it's weeks and weeks and weeks before you get back there. Well. That's hard on these engines. Rotax, two-stroke engines, you know, corrosion is a killer in these engines. So you can't just walk away from them like a lawnmower and expect it to work properly after. Because uh, my lawnmower doesn't either. I just walk away from it. It doesn't work good in the springtime. Um, so things we should be doing is when you do put the plane away, even if you're planning to come back tomorrow, you should plug the tailpipe, right? So I don't mean put a loose-fitting um, tennis ball over it. I mean plug it. Okay, um, Royal Distributing sells a really nice plug for a dirt bike so you can stick it up the exhaust and wash it. It's a tapered wedge thing and it fits in perfectly. You need like 10 bucks, go buy one because they're, they're really what you need. Plug up the exhaust so that it's plugged. Cover the air filter with something. Uh, if you don't have uh, one of those beautiful air cleaner covers that used to be around all the time, I don't know if they're available anymore, um, Dollarama sells a shower cap. You get a few of them for, you know, two bucks. Put a disposable shower cap over you. Cover it up, okay? Why is it important to do those two things? If we can stop the atmospheric air from circulating through the engine, if it's parked outside and the wind's blowing in the tailpipe, it's going to go in the muffler, it's going to go all through the engine, and it's going to come out of the air filter. And what's in that air? Moisture. Lots of it, especially in the summertime, right? So we want to prevent the moisture from getting in there because moisture in the metal parts, yeah, not a good combo. Makes rust. Okay. Does everybody uh, plug up their exhaust, or most everybody does? No. It's a, it's a it's a good way to ensure that you're going to try and you know prevent some corrosion. And and uh, and on corrosion, you know, a lot of times. There's pieces that come out of some engines that are otherwise, they're not wore out, but they're rusty. It's kind of a shame. It's basically a good part that still could have went in the bucket it goes because it's rusty. So 
we need to fog it, and I've heard that from a few people today that uh, out at the booth there, that they're, uh, they're actually fogging the engines when they put them away. They don't say they don't fly over in the wintertime and they fog it. That's beautiful. That's what you should be doing. Make an effort. So fog the engine. So what is it? It's really just a special kind of oil that, uh, that we, that we uh, when the engine's idling, you take the air filter off, stand by the propeller and spray it in the carburetors. And uh, then you can also, um, if you go by, oh, sorry, oh, it's in the wrong order. But anyway, we'll do this one. So that is the most rusted crankshaft that I've ever seen. So this is the PTO part, like uh, where the, the cog pulley goes on for the, on a Challenger. There's the rear seal, the two rear bearings. Look at all that brown in there. Uh, it's all rust. All these bearings, all the balls are all full of rust. Everything's got rust in it. Now, the, these are called flywheels, but the proper name, but both of these, these are, they, they actually look like silver metal when they're, you know, they have a, a, a not, not as shiny as that, but that's the same idea. So totally, totally rusted. And in here we can see the, we can see three, Actually, there, there's a space in there, so it's already some issue, but uh, where it's so black that you can't see it. But those are roller bearings in there, and, that, and this is the connecting rod, so the, the piston goes on up here. So that was probably a decent crankshaft, and then it got, they walked away from the airplane for two years. So that's what happens after two years with no protection. That's the worst one I've seen yet, put it that way. So I see that there's a need for this kind of stuff. So here's what's in the book from Rotax that you know you, you should all have them the uh, maintenance manuals. They're all available online from RotaxOwner.com. Fly Rotax. Uh, you can get them. You can download them onto your onto your phone, your iPad, whatever you're using, uh, which is pretty handy. So this is what they want you to do. They want you to put uh, six cc's or milliliters, same thing, uh, spray it in through the carburetors while it's idling. Um, of course, the air filter's off, the prop's turning, and then put 20 cc's in each cylinder. Well, that's pretty fine if you have an airplane where the spark plugs face up, but it's pretty hard to get it to go in 20, 20 uh, milliliters into, uh, into an upside-down engine where it's just going to pour it all over the place. So that's an issue with the, with the Challenger, uh, in particular anything where the engine's uh, inverted. So there is a procedure here. Not a lot of people ever look at this part of it, I don't think. The, uh, the fellow with the two-year uh, rusty cr uh, crankshaft there, he didn't look at this. He didn't read that page. Okay, so here's a bit of a sales pitch here. I put together a, an engine fogging kit. So it permanently mounts in there. You don't have to stand uh, beside the propeller. It's actually in the Challengers. We put it in behind the back seat. Uh, so when you come back from your flight, you're going to put the airplane away because you're going to come tomorrow, but it could be six weeks from now. Uh, you, uh, you just uh, operate, the, uh, operate the valve on here and uh, let the fluid in. There's a video on, well, it's on YouTube now. I'll put it on the website, uh, on, on the whole thing, the install video. And uh, it works whether the spark plugs are up or down, of course. Now, one thing that I did notice with this is that when you spray the fogging solution in manually out of the can, it's pretty hard to get them to start the next time because it seems to like really flood it, I guess you want to call it. Um, with this system here, we're, uh, and, and it's in the video, we actually, we just run the engine. So we come in after a flight, so we leave the engines idling, we just reach in behind the back seat, turn the valve open, and the engine breathes it in through the, uh, the tubing and uh, Generally, depending on how cold it is, how viscous the liquid is in there, the fogging well, maybe two minutes, three minutes, and sometimes I just wait till I see smoke coming out of the tailpipe. Okay? Once I see that, then I just turn the engine off, I close the valve, I'm done. Yeah, I want to come back tomorrow, but am I going to get there tomorrow? Yeah, maybe not. Maybe I will. So at least I know that if it's a month or two before I get back again, I've done something to protect it, then I cover the air filter and I plug the exhaust. Okay. Oh, sorry, I missed the letter. <laughs> okay, so we got some arborator ice. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is what it looks like. And uh, typically this is sort of the regular color. These are zinc, these carburetors. So this is sort of really lightly looking like what the freezer looks like. Okay, so what happens here is, and, and, and I will say there's a lot of people around that say, oh yeah, no, two-stroke never ever did can't carb ice and all these other things. Well, I've got a whole, I've got a series of, uh, I couldn't, I still can't find them. They're from a few years ago. We went way up north of Algonquin Park on a flight up to a friend's place. And every carburetor there from a whole flight of planes that went in there, the float bowl was not had ice on it, like frost on it. The whole rest of the carburetor did right to the cable. So it's, it's amazing. There's some fabulous pictures. I just got to find where they are from a few years ago. Um, but uh, the interesting part here is, and what's good with this one is, this right here is the slide is right here that goes up and down, and there's the needle, and inside there where it insert, inserts into is the needle jet. So we can see, because of the different speeds here, because we're going from bigger to smaller, this is why the ice deposits from the moisture in the air. So there's a pretty good crustacean right there starting to build up, and it will build to the point where it's really covered around, and right here, this is real important because that's where the air goes in that mixes with the fuel to give you the to soak. Because we can't burn liquid fuel, we have to mix air with it. So that'll frost right over, and of course, you know, you, you come in to land and you pull the power back and the engine stops. Or, you know, you're flying along and all of a sudden you're looking for a field because you think something's really bad here, it's going to stop. Okay? So, um, Actually, a little history on this is when, uh, when uh, John and I used to fly all the time from, uh, from uh, Baldwin to Montebello. Of course, uh, this time of year, it was always just above freezing, always very humid. It's the perfect conditions for carburetor ice in the wintertime. You get it in the summertime as well, but in winter condition. So we would stop at uh, 60, Highway 62 and Highway 7 on the lake there. And we'd pull the air filter off. And we had a toothbrush and some WD-40, and we'd go and we'd scrape all that out, and we'd spray it all down, put the air filter back on, and by the time we got the Smith's Falls to buy fuel, the things were barely running again. Okay, so it was a serious issue to me. And yes, if you, the only way that I found that it worked is if you left the throttle locked, never touch the throttle. Don't try and move it, leave it locked in one position. And then, of course, when you unlock the throttle and you go to land, the engine stops pretty much. And I uh, went, then eventually, it, when it feels like it's going to stop and you're going to look for a field, then it backfires really loud. I guess it cracks a lot of the ice off of there and it eats it, and then it runs again, but not well. So serious issue needed to be taken care of. So that's when I said, well, we got to fix this. So I came up with a, uh, a system for... Uh, because uh, increased heart rate, yes. Carburetor ice will give you increased heart rate, <laughs> without a doubt. <coughs> so here's one. This is an interesting picture because I was actually looking for the pictures I was just referring to. And uh, this is a 503 engine, uh, twin carburetors. And we can see the, uh, the regular color of the carb up here. And then we can see all the frost getting bigger and bigger. And none on the bowl, which is normal. They don't frost up the bowl. Okay, where do you think this engine was running? Actually, that's an unfair question. This engine was running on my test stand inside of my shop the beginning of, Fe the, like almost a year ago, the beginning of February. This was not outside. This wasn't on a lake. It wasn't way in the North Pole or anything. I was actually doing a break-in procedure on this engine right in the shop. And there we go. Okay. And I could tell because I could, I could, as soon as it went to, it even had a little different tone to it. So I stopped it and let it thaw out for a little while because this one didn't have the carburetor heat on it yet. I actually did put it on before it left. But Timing-wise, I wanted to get the, the uh, engine run-in procedure done because I have neighbors where I am, so I'm trying to be nice to my neighbors. So I do my engine running at nighttime. <laughs> so that's why I did that that way. So anyway, just uh, the recent shot, that's about a year and a week ago or something. So this electric carb heater, this one here, right here, it, there's a cavity in, inside the carburetor here that has a little opaque plug in it that uh, Rotax puts in there. I don't officially know why that cavity is in there. I think they use it to hold the carburetor while they machine the inside of it, but that's only my thought. So 
The reason it's done this way is because on a two-stroke engine, um, in comparison to a four-stroke engine or like a, say a Cessna, the Cessna we're using carburetor heat and it has hot air. So the engine's breathing in hot air to keep the ice at bay or melt the ice. Well, on our two-stroke engines, they don't like hot air. Heated air is not good. And you can get into, again, detonation, which is, you know, I, I, I describe akin to pinging. You're never going to hear it. It's just going to break something. Okay? So the way to do it on my theory was, let's heat up the whole carburetor body so that the ice can't stick. Okay? So that was the, uh, the thought on that. Um, I also have another kit now that fits the 912 engines. It has a more powerful heater in it because uh, the carburetor is a little further away on those. Um, so that's how it goes. It goes in that cavity. There's a, there's a drill that, that just cleans the hole and a, and a tab that comes with it and you can put it in. Uh, there's a picture of the kit. Sorry for the sales pitch, but I think these things are important safety-wise for, for, uh, for everybody to know. Uh, and again, you can get... Uh, So one other thing. So a fellow phoned me one time. He lived over by the shore of Lake Huron. And uh, he had a 582 on his airplane, but it was a Rotax two-stroke. And he says, okay, John, I've done this and this and this, and I tried carburetors off another plane, and I tried all kinds of things, and I just, this thing will not run right. It just won't run. So I'm listening the whole time, and I'm thinking, whoa. So I said, I think you pretty much covered all of those things. Before I could say anything, he said, well, do you think your carburetor or heater kit would help? And I said, I don't know. Why not? You'll be the first to know. So he said, send me a kit. So I sent him a kit. A couple of days shipping. He won't hear anything. I'm thinking I should probably call him. And about three weeks later, he phones. And he says, oh, John, I put that on. He says, that thing has not missed a beat. I've taken off, landed, flown all over the place. And the theory behind it when we were discussing on the phone is because he lives right on the shore of Lake Huron. Northwest wind, there's a lot of fetch off of Huron of nice, cool, damp air. And he's right by the, right by the, the shore. So uh, he was getting severe carb ice in the summertime. And this fixed it for him because uh, it was great. And, I mean, he always managed to be able to land the plane and everything. But, uh, no, he just raved about it. So as a matter of fact, I was at a show one time at the UPAC conference. And I had my little display carburetor sitting on the table. My, how's my time? Am I done? Okay, a couple minutes. I'm almost done. Okay, I'll skip to the next one. Okay, the battery isn't charging. That's another one. So is it the battery? Is it the voltage regulator? Is it the stator? What is it? You know, how, how can we do it? So my approach is to try the cheap and easy stuff first. Right? So... Here's the wiring diagram that it is that is in there for the charging system in the Rotax book. And I don't know how many people in the room here speak electricity, but it's a little daunting for some people. Okay? So what I did was in the next one here is I took out all of the other things that were that didn't matter and colored it up. So this is our Key West regulator that most everybody uses. It has four terminals, two yellows, a red and a black. So the yellow wire here and the yellow black, they bring AC electricity from inside, the, from the stator, out through the plug in the wire harness in the side of the block. AC comes in, okay? So this is the garage. Two cars come out of the garage and drive into the regulator, okay? At this point, one car gets parked, and we come up with DC power. And DC drives down here, goes through the fuse and to the battery. A lot of times... This fuse here is blown, or the fuse is good, but the fuse holder is kind of melted. So check your circuits. We're grounded from the engine to the airframe. We're grounded from the regulator to the airframe and the battery to the airframe. So this is the biggest problem I find right here. Anywhere in the red circuit is usually the easiest one to find. Now, I know I'm short on time, so quickly, if you start the airplane up and you have a digital voltmeter, everybody has a DVO on pretty much, and you can make it work on DC volts, put it on the black one here and the red one there. If it shows over 
15 volts, like 15.4 volts, and you go, that's lots. Yeah, when it's 15.4 volts, that's actually telling you that it's not making it to the battery. Because these voltage regulators are manufactured so that you don't have to have a battery in the system. You can hook a radio up to that thing and run it. It doesn't even need a battery. So the key to that is when you test the voltage across here, from here to here, if it's more than 15 volts, it's disconnected somewhere. There's a problem. Typically, it's fuse or fuse. Yes, sir. Um, it generally isn't. Now, oh, that's a good point though. There should be nothing. The wire that comes from here and goes to the battery, it's in solitude. It should have nothing else hooked up to it. Nothing. It should be a single wire that runs out there. Uh, the, there'd be another lead that would come off here that would go to your master and then you'd have your voltmeter on there. Okay. So you'd never even know. Except all of a sudden the battery's dead. No, no, because if you're getting over 15 volts on these two, it doesn't even know this stuff exists. And if it's there, it's broken somewhere. The wire's broken, the fuse is gone. Typically, the fuse holder melts. So you'll take the fuse out and look at it and go, the fuse is perfect. Check with the ohmmeter, fuse is perfect. But where it slips on to the fuse holder, no good. Okay, so if you're having an issue there, maybe the easiest thing to do is just stick a new fuse and a fuse holder in right off the hop. Right? It could, yeah, because it has to know, it has to sense voltage and it has to know. So if it had a ground problem here, it won't work. And the key to the whole thing is if you quick check it and it has over 15 volts on those two, then it's not getting to the battery this way or, it, it, or the other side, the ground side is not working. Make sense? No, no, if you get the 15 volt reading, no, they're designed to run with no battery at all. No, no load on them at all, and they'll work fine. Yeah. So, all right. I, I was going to do Q and A, but I don't know how much time is left, or it's probably burned up. Where are we? Where are we, Toby? Two oh three. It says anybody. If we got time for a couple of quick questions, if anybody has one. Any questions? If you think of something after, come over to the booth and we'll chat. All right. So again. Um, thank you for the thank you for the hour that you spent in here. I hope that I enlightened you somehow. You learned something out of this, and uh, and maybe uh, if you have a two stroke and you know somebody with a four stroke, maybe you can help them out with what they're doing and vice versa. So we all have to work together, keep the sport going, keep it safe, right? So happy flying, everybody, and thank you for your attention.